All right. So we talked about the oscillator amplitude. And one of the things that we know about oscillators is that oscillators have these different re re regimes of operation. So if you look at the oscillator tank voltage versus the tail current of a typical oscillator, you have a, initially you have a region that you don't arrive at the startup. If your current is too small, the oscillator simply does not oscillate. You need to establish a certain minimum current for it to start oscillating. And when that happens, you have a region that's practically more or less like a linear increase. That's what we call the current limited regime. And in that regime, there's some equivalent tank resistance from, with some coefficients times some the bias current that determines the current. And at some point, you will go to, into a saturation where the voltage limited regime comes in. You have some sort of a rail or something you hit, and then you do not increase the amplitude significantly beyond that. So now, this, if this, is a real, this is the amplitude of a real oscillator from simulations. You can see that the, this is not exactly linear, and this is not exactly like a, like a sharp corner. So it's a transition. So there's this knee up of operation here. So one question we have. And this is probably the most important, the first order thing um, for an oscillator design. So this is where 50, more than 50% of the problems in oscillator design come from, is where do you bias your oscillator? Where do you set it up? Where, at what current level? Or where do you put it up? Put, so in terms of where do you think, if you have a fixed power budget, how should you design an oscillator for it to operate where in, on, along this curve? Well. Around here, right? You want the oscillator amplitude we saw from the phase noise perspective that plays a role because you have a charge maximum charge swing that is the denominator of the expression for the phase noise. So if you want to minimize the phase noise, you need to have the largest mag, mag, uh, amplitude of oscillation, but you want to generate the least amount of noise. So you want to get the most charge swing for the least amount of noise generated and the least amount of power consumed. And it means that if you actually, I mean, intuitively, if you think about it, if you're around here, if you're at the edge of that voltage limited regime, if you're getting there, now going beyond that, you're just burning more current, which generates noise, more noise and also dissipates more power, but you're not getting more amplitude swing and hence no ch more charge swing. So you're wasting current there. And so you want to be here, often you want to kind of be a little bit inside the voltage limited regime because you want to maintain some sort of a margin operation, if the parameters change and all those things, you don't fall back too much. Now, and that also means that if you're trying to operate here, then it means that as you if you increase the quality factor of your tank, which basically means that increasing the equivalent R tank, the parallel equivalent resistance for a parallel tank, then you can achieve this voltage on a smaller current. Or if you have a fixed current, you will see that it allows you to design a better tank. Okay, so how is that done? Now, if you remember the expression for phase noise that we have, if you rewrite it uh, he, here, what you see that we had a Q max squared in the denominator. And you have also the F offset, and then you have some of all the currents. Now, Q max, the maximum charge swing, lower Q max, not the quality factor, which is the uppercase Q max. This is the charge swing. is basically the capacitance of the tank to the voltage swing. And you can also, since the frequency of oscillation is omega naught, you can actually write it as V, uh, uh, the voltage swing, divided by L tank times omega naught squared. Now, there are various noise sources that contribute no total noise. Now, and there are two different regions of operation. So what you see is that if you look at that expression for the phase noise and simplify it and absorb all the things that you don't care about in this calculation, you will see that you get an expression like this. K L, I, L, L, L squared I V swing squared. Now, if you evaluate this in the current limited regime where the V swing is proportional to the I tank, what happens is that you get an expression that's inversely proportional to the I, the bias current. So you get K L, I, L squared G tank squared divided by I, which means that if you increase the current, what happens to the phase noise in the current limited regime? Your phase noise improves, becomes smaller, right? It's a noise to signal ratio. Phase noise is a noise to signal ratio. Um, so basically it improves. But now if you evaluate this in the voltage limited regime where this is essentially constants on V supply, then you will see that because your noise sources increase with the I, what ha is in fact you actually degrade the noise uh, performance by increasing the current because you're getting more noise into the system introduced without in increasing the voltage sw or charge swing significantly. So basically in one end of the spectrum, so here if you go beyond that limit you're wasting power. Now on the other end the question is that you have, when you're designing a tank, you really have 
two parameters you can play with. You can, have, you can choose an L, you can choose a C, right? You can choose an inductor and a capacitor. And what you care about in terms of determining the frequency is the product of the two. So you, you want the product to be a known fixed quantity for a given frequency of oscillation, right? But that leaves one degree of freedom. Because you have two quantities whose product is fixed, but you can make one larger and the other one smaller, right? And keeping the product the same. So the question is, how do you choose the value of capacitor or the inductor? So what this thing tells you from the, that you see in the inductor in the numerator is that you actually want to minimize the inductance, right? Because inductance, minimizing the inductance in that sense reduces your phase noise. Now, up to what point? As you minimize the inductance, you need to have more and more current for startup. And also, that, that to maintain the loop gate requirement, which is basically the, what, what it sets the startup. So you need to basically choose it at, at that edge with the in minimum inductance that guarantees a sufficient amount of uh, you know, startup condition. What do we mean by startup condition? Is that if you look at the open loop of the uh, uh, system at very low amplitudes, you want that open loop gain to be larger than a factor, uh, larger than one for sure. Typically, we pick it to be greater than two sometimes, between two and three, to guarantee startup. It's kind of like rules of thumbs of design, really. So now, if you remember also, so this is from the amplitude perspective. The other thing that if you remember from last time a discussion we had on phase noise was that we had these cyclostationary noise sources, noise sources that, whose statistical properties changed with different times of the cycle. So we saw that, for example, if, you, if your noise was injected at the point of least sensitivity, that was a good thing, right? And, and so the question is that, can you do that in practice? So this is a very standard typical topology for os uh, LC oscillators in integrated circuits. So you basically have a negative resistance. You have an, a, a cross-coupled PIMFET and a cross-coupled NFET and some bias current. And you have a tank in parallel. And if you look at something like this, you can easily see that for something like this, in general, you will have, you can calculate the ISF, which is in this case is shown, the, the original ISF is shown as the, the blue curve. And then you have the noise modulating function for one of these transistors, which is the, the black curve, and the effective ISF, which is the red curve. So you can see that your effective ISF is not significantly reduced by cyclostationary noise alignment. Now, there was another oscillator that did a really good job in this uh, regard when we looked at it, and that was the Kolpitz oscillator, right? If you look at the Kolpitz oscillator, this example that we are showing here, this Kolpitz oscillator has an interesting property because, you know, if you look at the effective ISF, the original ISF, which is again shown in blue, the uh, noise modulating function shown in uh, black, and the uh, effective ISF shown in red, you can see that the effective ISF is significantly reduced because of the alignment of noise, the maximum noise, with minimum sensitivity point. So, but the question is that, is this a good thing to implement as an, as an integrated oscillator? So there are several challenges with this. One is that this is single-ended. On, on, on integrated circuits, preferably would like to deal with as many differential things as possible, both to reduce its sensitivity to common mode fluctuations as well as producing less common mode fluctuation. This sums, sum, sums it up. So for example, if you had that complementary stage, the, the two cross-coupled stages with NMOS and PMOS, and then you have the co-pits, so this is, um, you know, what, what you need to do here is that you actually have that relationship between the I bias and R tank. And you can see that this relationship, the coefficient in front of this relationship is different for this. We derive this to be 2 times 1 minus n for the Kolpitz, for example, right? And for the complementary device, it's 4 over pi. So you actually, for the same tail current, you will get more amplitude from the Kolpitz. So that's another advantage of the Kolpitz. But you need a larger startup gain. And here the challenge is that how do you do the, deal with that and how do you make it single-ended? And how do you make it differential because it's a single-ended stage? So this goes, the next couple of slides show you a little bit of an evolution of that concept to show you how you actually can go from single-ended to, to from a single-ended design to a differential design and leads to what we call a noise shifting oscillator. So, so starting with this, let's imagine that you want to make a differential stage. Now the idea of a differential stage is that the two sides go in opposite direction, right? It's an anti-symmetric design. So if I make a copy of this and put it right next to it and you have the ground, so you can see that you have something like this. If we had this and if we were connecting this node to ground, so if you had two, two of this side by side next to each other, what do you think would happen? Would you generate a differential signal? No. What would happen? Both, of the, both sides go up and down together. The injection lock to each other and move up and down. 
So instead of producing a single-ended oscillator, uh, so the differential oscillator, you produce a common mode oscillator, right? So the question is that can we make a modification to this so that in the common mode gain, in the common mode, this doesn't work, but in differential mode, this actually looks that the circuit looks like this. Now, if you think about the concept of half circuits, right? When you are in a differential mode, this middle node is what? Is a virtual ground. So it's actually, the solution is actually pretty straightforward. Instead of connecting this to ground, you leave it open. You can leave that capacitor open. So what does that do? If you had a differential signal, then it would become this oscillator and oscillate like that. If you had a common mode signal, this capacitor is open on this end for the common mode signal. And hence, your oscillator is perturbed, so it can, will not be necessarily maintaining a common mode oscillation. So it would basically have a better, it would be have the proper properties for the differential operation, but not the common mode. So the trick is pretty simple. Just basically remove this, this um, ground connection and make it, a, make it float. Now, if you remove this ground connection and you have two capacitors in series, well, you can replace it with one capacitor, right, of half the value and cut your area by a factor of four because you went from two C2s to half a C2, right? So you can do that there. And then you, the other thing that when you do this, you notice is that, well, if you look at the currents and voltages of this thing, the, the drain current of this one, you will see that the drain of this, this transistor is essentially off for half of the cycle. So this tail current source is really used for half of the cycle here. And this tail current source is used for the other half of the cycle. So if you're using this current for half of the cycle here and half of it there, and for the other half, they're just sitting there generating noise, is it possible for us to basically share the same current and switch it back and forth between the left side and the right side? So if you had this like demon, little demon that could come and come and connect it to the left and say, oh, okay, now we need it on the right, connect it to the left, right, left, right, left, right, switch it to the right place, then I can actually we can use the same current source on the on both sides, right? To think about it relatively simplistically. Now, how do we do that? Well. What is the demon that, what is the thing that takes the current and switches it from one side to the other? We have that block. It's a differential pair, right? If you drive the differential pair hard enough, you just steer the current to one side or the other. You can switch the current. The only thing is that you need to provide a voltage that is synchronized with the oscillator to drive its inputs, right? But you also have that voltage. That voltage is here in the present, either at the drain or at the source of these transistors, because that's the oscillation waveform itself. So if you do that, this is that differential pair connected to the input, which also happens to be the cross-coupled pair, which presents a negative resistance and helps with the startup. And then, of course, now you've actually taken this capacitor and divided it into two halves. And what that does is basically produces this topology, which we call a noise-shifting Kolpitz oscillator. Now, if you wanted to also make it, into, make it into a VCO, you need to have some sort of a variable capacitor here. So you can actually introduce a varactor, which can be implemented in different ways. You can implement it as a PN junction. You've looked at this in one of your problem sets way back. You can actually have a PN junction whose vo by changing the voltage on it, you use a nonlinear capacitor. Or you could use a MOSFET or a MOS cap. And you can have either inversion mode MOS caps, which is basically just like a MOSFET, where the drain and source are connected to each other, or you can have the so-called accumulation mode uh, varactors, which are where the, instead of having an N plus in P well, or you have an N plus in N, and you use the accumulation mode of capacitance, which is basically faster and have, has a higher Q because you basically, the charge that comes in is the majority charge carrier in that channel. Um, so uh, this is basically now, now what you can see is that the effective ISF is significantly lower in this case, in this case of a noise shifting um, oscillator. And you can actually make them and look at them and see what kind of a property. So this is an example of something that was made many years ago based on this, uh, based on this concept, an oscillator. This is an integrated oscillator based on that. These are the inductors, this is the tail inductor. Uh, it is a tuning range. You have about 30% of tuning range over this oscillator. So by controlling the control voltage, you can actually tune it over 30%, which is quite a bit. And this is a plot of its phase noise measured um, at that frequency, which is basically, this was like a 1.8 gigahertz uh, oscillation. So this presents a, an example for you of how those principles are applied to oscillator design.